Hey there, everyone. Now, I've been reviewing my Taekwondo uh, forms, and the forms that I know are the Sangam system, the uh, American Taekwondo Association system. So that's um, a little bit different than what a lot of people know for Taekwondo, like if you do the tagged forms, and those, those forms that go up and down and have... Anyways, um, it's kind of fun, you know. I guess this is where um, you can turn into a real karate nerd, you know, because what we do is we break down how a technique should be done. And here's the old saying that the, that a punch is a punch at, or, or a kick is a kick, right? Well, different um, systems of martial arts have their own way of teaching people how to do basic things. And, and some of those things, that's why they kind of encourage people not to cross train, like you shouldn't be in a Taekwondo system and going to Kung Fu at the same time, for example, because of stuff like this. Now, my personal path has been Taekwondo first. The, um, the summer I turned 12, I started Taekwondo. And um, I don't know, maybe four to six years altogether before I dropped out and and I was on to um, Kempo, it was a Kempo Wushu system, like part of the Parker system. And uh, I think I spent about a couple of years training with that guy. And then next I went to the, um, the Chinese Shaolin Center. I may have trained like, you know, a, as many as six years all together because I was like in and out, you know. And then I spent a couple of years at the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school that also has like kickboxing and judo and stuff. So. Um, so that's my um, experience, and that's what contributes to my point of view. So um, I kind of feel like everything, kind of like with Chinese and like let's say maybe the the Koreans and the Japanese are really close relatives. So you know, so my brief understanding, briefly anyways, but my understanding is how um, you know what we have as Asian martial arts are quite influenced by the uh, the guy known as Bodhidharma that came over from India. And they have a martial art over there called um, Kalari Prayadu. And that may have some influence on how we do Shaolin Kung Fu. Because if you look at that, it's got the deep low stances and stuff. And um, and then along with that, the, the, the breathing meditation. You know, the what later became Zen meditation. Because that same teacher, you know, he spent some good amount of time in China. With the, uh, the, uh, with the Shaolin and, you know, really helped make it what it is pretty much right so and then he went to japan and that's why we have the phrase uh, zen buddhism so this same teacher also went into like thailand and indonesia this stuff looks a little different but you know we're, we're related by that that's what makes it all vedic i really feel like you know we're talking about like karate and taekwondo um they're like uh influenced by kung fu a lot of times like karate meant china hand or like tang Sudo might have been when the Tang Dynasty, maybe you know, so they're acknowledging they have an influence from China. But you know what happens when that uh, Chinese martial arts comes to Japan or Korea is it changes a little bit because of the mindset that the people have there. So that's why you might think that karate and kung fu are different. Because my little joke has been that when you um, when a Japanese person does kung fu, it's called karate. <laughs> so taekwondo is also kung fu, pretty much, you know. And so I kind of um, I kind of lump all of my uh, Asian mar martial arts together under Shaolin for for that matter. So I feel like what's happened with me, it's um, Taekwondo is what, sort of a modernization. You know, it's, it's it's supposed to be a shortcut to power to like give people a chance to be able to learn how to strike with good power um, without taking too much time. So in a couple of years, you're ready to really you know make it effect effective, right? So. Whereas um, traditional training, like if you're talking the, like the Shaolin monks, you know, they practically have to stand in horse dance for two years before they see any Kung Fu, you know, right? So, um, <clears throat> so anyways, um, I've been going over my Taekwondo and just thinking how funny it is how uh, one system looks at doing the same thing as another. Now, um, so I want to start out with the, the first form that we get in uh, Taekwondo and, um, so this is something that I kind of see consistent in uh, other arts, like 
like in Kung Fu and Tai Chi actually. So in Tai Chi, for example, I might step out. Here's the fancy one. How about this? I'm going to step. I'm going to shift my weight left. I'm going to raise up my right heel, raise up my left heel. Boom. So that's how we do um, kind of like a, a like Chen style Tai Chi. Very expressive. So what's happening here is I'm rooting to the ground. And so a lot of Kung Fu forms start out where we step out into a, a shoulder with stance. So um, that's something that, um, so now that as a Taekwondo student, or maybe coming back to Taekwondo, when I step out, I don't do all that. It's very simple. It's like Yang style Tai Chi is the same thing. You should just step right out. And I do it with my breath, you know, so. And then um, the way we do Song on One is uh, Chun Bi. It means ready stance. So when you step to that stance, this is why, you know, I would take my, um, my further training and bring it back to my Taekwondo. So I'm going to breathe in. Maybe it's, a, it's not a very long breath. But that's, uh, that's where just like Tai Chi, I want to root to the ground, you know. Now in the Taekwondo, um, they have us um, do kind of like, um, I can't think of it as a mock movement in this case, like for the high block. It's almost like a false high block. And then when you step out, you kind of replace it with the actual high block. Now, <clears throat> here's the contradiction to some of my other training. In fact, I, mean, I almost thought before um, when I learned Song on One that um, that we should be bringing this hand to the outside of the forearm, but um, I've, I've watched a lot of videos and I think the masters are teaching it out as your blocking hat should come to the inside of the pullback hand. So that seems to be a contradiction. I'm gonna tell you why. Um, now in Sheldon, um, I don't really think we have a block just like this, at least not at the Sheldon Center where I trained. I mean, we do have blocks that are like this, and like this, and sometimes like this even. But um, I don't think we talk about one that is just like this. But in Kempo, there is, and I think Karate, they do it like that too. Now going to the, um, the Wushu Kempo, I think over here a JBJ Dojo, so if you're from Kalispell, they have more of a Karate Kempo. So I'm from a Wushu Kempo, so more Chinese, so they have a more... Japanese flavor of their Kempo and so I'm gonna stand just like this and so we go through all the four blocks you know that's part of our warm-up training you know so they'll have us do I think you know we do a couple of high blocks I don't remember if, if they had us do outer to inner then inner to outer and just go through these four blocks and I'm pretty sure when they had us do the high block they probably start palm in and go like that you know and so, um, and that ties in with other movements, like say, um, maybe if it was your inner forearm block, it's going to come to the outside like this. Um, let me see. And so, now the thing that's the same would be our low block in Taekwondo. I think we do just like that. So in all cases, but um, looking at the way we deal with these inner forearm blocks. Um, so I was going over this Kempo place, right? I, I don't know if Taekwondo taught me this. Uh, I think Taekwondo teaches us more like um, palms down or palms out, and then and then you're gonna flip the palm. So both palms need to flip in all of our movements. You know, so we want even on this one, this hand needs to flip. That's the thing as we make them flip at the same time. So that's another thing we're gonna talk about next. But on blocking, um, now when it comes to Shaolin and Taoist roots, I kind of think Taekwondo might have some. Some of this type of influence. I think the masters who've helped develop Taekwondo hopefully have looked into um, Shigi, the five element boxing. So, um, so one of the things uh, that we would take from there um, is that our low blocks and our inner forearm blocks comes from the element of earth and the way it is expressed in its fullness. It's kind of like a big circle gathering up the energy and then I think we um, gather up, and these are chambered for a low block and an inner forearm block. So it could be either or, you know, it could be one, it could be the other. And sometimes this inner forearm block is a back knuckle, you know, or striking. So, um, and then as we're um, gathering to make that uh, chamber, you could be pulling this block out of it, you know. And this movement as well is part of that. It could be part of that. So anyways, um, 
so the way I um, do that block has always had a flip to it. Now, I guess I was bringing this up because over at that uh, Kempo Karate School, he didn't like me doing that. He wants our hands to be palm in the whole way, right? Now, doing that, you're just taking, like, you're hitting straight in, but, you know, the way I'm doing it, rotating it, that helps deflect what you're hitting. It deflects what you're hitting. That's why we do that. So this is where I totally disagree with those guys. And now these Taekwondo is right about that, but that we want to have that rotation because that helps deflecting, okay? And similarly on that high block, it, it somewhat helps him, helps to deflect, and especially if you're hitting something like somebody's leg, you know? So we throw a front kick and you're going to, what, hit somebody in the leg with your uh, arm here. So you want to deflect that. <laughs> you don't want to just take it in your arm, right? So so that makes sense. Now, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, um, I'm just going to talk about maybe that form song on one after you did the block, pointing and punching. Now, in reality, like, okay, let's say I, um, we, we want to have a good pullback hand. That's the idea, you know, so sometimes it's really nice. Um, so we really emphasize a lot on making a reaction hand for our, our other, you know, like, especially if we're going to throw a punch with the, the hand that connects with the back leg, right? So if we were using more like the, um, like the, uh, the Kempo or the Karate, I think they would just probably expect your arms to cross here to get that good block. But if you think about it, you're not really getting the benefit of rotating this. It's just going to be pulled straight back. It's just like this. So that's what most systems would probably want. But Taekwondo wants us to reach all the way up there. And uh, so that's probably. <laughs> now, later on, we learned um, the, to move without that, uh, that much exaggeration. So I like to think maybe this is just a very exaggerated way to start somebody out with that particular block, you know. Because then later on, you know, you know, you really, you know, when you learn to use that high block from a sparring stance, then there's no pullback at all, for example. And then in black belt forms, we do a lot of stuff where the pullback hand is set before we do the action. So stuff like that. So it could be a way to help students to internalize that uh, that pullback. So later on, we don't need as much. So anyways, um, about that high block, <laughs> that, that's definitely something kind of uh, unique to Taekwondo, is having a mock block before... The, the actual block comes out where again most systems might just expect your forearms to cross on the outside and not on the inside and then um onto the uh, punch huh, huh. that's another example of exaggerated movement because i kind of think in reality um i kind of like the idea of this arm gathering something up as it's coming down what if i block something and it slides down and i can catch it somehow you know so that pullback can could be connecting with the arm boom so if it was here and it came straight down not only that um, but there's an up and down energy that's going on here so for example if I were to use this motion and pull down I'm getting power from pulling that up and down motion too so that's kind of um, where I would look at it like that and so for me it makes sense anyways to just pull it right down but Taekwondo calls for we're gonna reach and pull back that way, stuff like that. So that's where you have to be mindful. So when, you know, let's say if you're gonna spend time at this school for a while, uh, the name of the game, especially if you're gonna test over the curriculum is, can you remember and repeat things, you know? So whether you actually think that's the best way to do it or not. So there's a lot of good things that come with Taekwondo. And, uh, and for the most part, um, that's probably one of the blocks you're least likely to use in uh, a lot of cases, you're more likely to use uh, more like parries and stuff like that, you know? So, I mean, that's the funny thing is how what part of the art is you, you end up learning these really huge exaggerated movements. And that's not only Taekwondo, but I think just all of the arts that have katas and stuff. Um, it's a great way to um, train the body to move correctly because in sparring, it might just look like a blur, right? So that's how you add uh, definition to each movement, you know, and way to break everything down. So, um, so that's what katas are really for. It gives us like, it's like a, it's like a talking tool, basically, you know, it's like our little, it's the book, you know, <laughs> so it gives us all, all something to connect with. So that way I can go to any Taekwondo school in our system in the world and, and we can go over these forms and we have a, a place to start in our conversation. We both know Song on One, for example. 
So after I have done, let's say, the ATA Taekwondo mock block and then real block. So it's almost like a mock punch before the real punch, except in a low block. So after we've thrown a front kick, the low block is going to be palm down, and then this is going to be palm to the ear, because that way both hands are going to... And so that's kind of um, like I was talking about, let me see. Same thing with our uh, Shingi and our Kung Fu. The same exact thing is going to happen. Um, probably same in Karate and uh, definitely going to be true in Kempo. So I think when I did Kempo, um, I'm kind of thinking their high block was probably more like this, you know. And then let me see, I think they teach an outer to inner foreign block. We don't really teach that in Taekwondo, by the way. Um, may maybe we'll see a hammer fist, but they don't like us to... I don't think they encourage that type of block because it might be something that gets you in more trouble like this. So it's not necessarily that it's not useful, but m maybe it's something that gets you in trouble. So we don't really show that. Anyways, um, so a lot of other systems like Kempo and probably Karate teach that outer inner block like this. And so let me see. Then the way they teach probably just palm up and then... Now, I was going to bring up is that Shaolin is... um. A traditional Shaolin, at least the one I come from, um, those were masters that were running away when they were trying to destroy the, the Shaolin temple, so they went to Indonesia. So according to this, uh, the history of, that we get with our, um, our training there, is our masters were training in Indonesia, and they didn't like Chinese people very much, so they had to look like they were at a, a karate school. And so they kind of disguised their Kung Fu training as karate, but I think that they were able to get away with it because a lot of it already does look like karate. And so if you go back to the older traditional Kung Fu, you know, what you're seeing that uh, maybe you see like the monks and, and the temple style of Kung Fu, there's more actually Wushu. So it's a little bit different. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's Kung Fu, but it's Wushu Kung Fu. It's, it's a slightly different flavor to it when you look at old traditional Kung Fu. Somewhat I was surprised it's like very crude looking. It's just not all as... Uh, flowery as I expected, right? So, anyways, um, something they teach us though is like um, the way we hold our guard is like this, you know. But the concept here, okay, like I say, I'm moving forward. Is this hand? It's like let's say there's something here, you know. I could be using this and coming this way. So this is always the way we move. And if I'm gonna turn, we're gonna move like this. So it's always like this. And so that's kind of like how our blocks come off, just the same. So if I was gonna throw a block out there. It's probably going to come out just like that, you know. I'm just going to finish it by pulling back at best. I don't know. So I think, again, you know, if it's meant to be a striking block, I might actually make sure I can at least twist the striking wrist. So, um, okay. And so when I'm looking at how um, our footwork is, too, you know. So let's say, you know, I was going this way. Um, this foot, the left foot and the left hand in this case, so... I'm in mirror vision. Um, my left foot and my left hand are going to move, and then my right hand and my right foot are going to move. So a lot of times that's how we change direction. So if I was doing Song on One with the Kung Fu uh, footwork. Let's say I had just gone uh, from the, the front kick to the low block, okay, and now we're going to step through the punch. Now, when I step to um, the inner forearm block, what I would do if it was Kung Fu, so I don't know if this applies, that's a good question, is um, as I go to chamber, I would probably start to pivot my left foot this way as I'm chambering, and then as I'm uh, resetting my foot, the horse stance, then the block should occur at the same time, just because um, I kind of I kinda, uh, think of um, using my uh, what was going to be my pullback hand. It corresponds to the, the foot, in this case, turning and me turning my head as well just like that so that's how I coordinate it all now um, Kung Fu does have uh, the similarity of um, moving sideways like this you know so we might even do like cross behind you can't see my feet you know maybe cross behind and throw a side kick Shabam! but I think the side kick is practically the same thing all across the board you know so now how it's taught out might be slightly different but it's pretty much the same thing. You should be standing like you should be going sideways when you execute a sidekick. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I 
Now, something in the traditional martial arts, like uh, the old school uh, type uh, kung fu, let's say, um, maybe this was like song on one, like before I throw the front kick, I might actually put my toe out to about a 45 degree angle or so. So that way when I kick, my hip is already open to up. And then it might even, you know, I might pivot on the ball of my foot just a little bit more if I need to. Um, now that's a good idea actually if, um, so Taekwondo, uh, before I say that though, um, Taekwondo wants to recommend is that as you kick, so as you go through the kick, you should have your foot pointed forward as we start the kick, but then let it pivot on the ball of the foot and that really kind of helps open up and release. And that way you're not um, telegraphing. So that's a good idea to avoid telegraphing, but if it's not necessary, then, you know, being able to put your toe out a little bit really helps to make that front kick a lot easier. So that's another example. Um, and then uh, now Muay Thai, since I was over here at uh, Strict West Gym, we talk a little bit about Muay Thai as part of our um, kickboxing. So um, especially if I'm going to pull my leg back, I don't have to turn my toe at all, you know. So like if I'm going to kick and pull my foot back, I might let my, my heel raise up a little bit. But um, that the kick's just a little bit different too. So uh, Taekwondo, we might be talking about more of a snapping ball kick, where Japan um, is relying more on the snapping action, and it might be good for uh, an angled uh, target. Whereas the uh, the Muay Thai kick is more, it could be useful hitting something like this, standing straight up, you know. So um, that's where uh, when I kick, it's like I'm gonna let my hips go forward ahead of my hips and my, I should say my shoulders and my feet are uh, on the same line, but my hips are going to come on through and that allows me to more of a thrusting front kick. So there's a difference between a snapping front kick and a thrusting front kick. Now, I, I visited the, um, a Shotokan school and uh, the lady there that was teaching, she was a black belt instructor there and she was telling me she notices when I kick you know, I leave my hips back here, you know, I just put my foot out and snap my kick. Well, um, I'm pretty sure Taekwondo expects you to, to put a little more hip into it, but maybe I didn't pick that up yet, you know. And so when you throw a front kick, you should, you should I, I think I think it's almost like you kind of bring your hip under a certain way, right? It's hard to explain that, but it's just like when you punch, right, you know, don't you put your hip behind it, you know. So it's similarly, you know, I don't just want to leave my hips back there when I'm kicking because um, I'm not letting it release and come through. So stuff like that, that's where you get really nerdy about your uh, martial arts is, you know, should I pivot my foot? I kind of think pivoting your foot a little bit is great to, to let everything release like this. See, that's the reason for it. Otherwise, um, I kind of like the Muay Thai concept of, you know, stay letting your foot stay pointed forward and being able to retrieve my leg a lot easier. Um, yeah, just thought that was fun to share that contrast. Not that I've spent enough time in Muay Thai to feel like, you know, I'm an official Muay Thai person, right? But there are things that I take with me. Um, like Muay Thai kind of blows my mind because like, okay, my first round kick is to, um, you know, kick with the ball of the foot, you know, and then you bring your foot back and then even retrieve your leg, you, you know, which I always thought was a pain in the ass, right? But the way they do it is more of a shin kick. So you come through, it's like you whip that leg and then you keep spinning on through. Like we tell you, oh, don't ever do that. That's <laughs> that's not how you do it, you know? Then your opponent's gonna get your pack. So, well, I'm thinking, well, if you nail them with that whippy kick like that, they're probably not gonna get your back. So, but that, that I guess that really depends on if you landed or not, right? But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of funny looking at the contrast of, particularly on these blocks, you know? Um, I think, um, Karate, Kung Fu, Kempo, Taekwondo, all going to teach us the same way to make a fist. You kind of fold your hand up and curl your thumb. So that's your basic punch. Now later on in um, the internal arts, we learn to make kind of a, more of a cupped fist. It's like slightly hollow inside. So I've been working with that a little bit. And um, the funny thing is, is when you train with boxing gloves, it trains you to, <laughs> to form shingy fists, right? So that's the funny thing. So your Taekwondo punches should be just like a karate punch. So I like to call this a karate punch when I'm talking martial arts. Is if, if your punch is like this, which is actually the boxing class, they tell us the same, and your punches are like this, 
these are karate punches. This is something you learn in the Asian side, particularly Kung Fu, karate, Taekwondo, and then Kempo, I put in the middle of all those because they are kind of like merging either, uh, you know, with uh, the Chinese or the, the karate and sometimes a little with the Taekwondo. And, and so their mentality is to try to like learn from everything and, and take everything that works best. So assuming some of the stuff uh, doesn't work for some reason, you know, there's a lot of flowery stuff in katas and martial arts that people should, you know, forget about, right? But the Taekwondo mentality is a way to uh, to simplify your training. So the Kempo guys, they were trying to consolidate all of the martial arts that, you know, in their world, that was all the martial arts there was, you know, right? So to them, they were like gathering all the martial arts. So like, if that same Kempo mentality is being applied now that you have the internet and everything, then it should contain everything in the world, right? So, <laughs> so that's where, um, actually, uh, Jeff Speakman has tried to embrace um, some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so some down and ground grappling he's tried to incorporate in the Kempo. So that means um, he's being flexible because otherwise if you're just being stick to the old plan and never change it, then you're not evolving. So that's where um, sometimes we get caught up in tradition is like we say, okay, everything's going to be just like this for the next million years, you know, because this guy wants to take credit for creating art and art and having everybody learn it. So you don't want that to happen. Now, when we talk about traditional martial arts, like, like uh, what, Kung Fu, Shaolin Kung Fu, let's say like the Chinese Shaolin Center where I used to train, that's a slightly different agenda. That's more like we're trying to preserve the classics. You know, like, let's say you're part of an orchestra that plays classical music. You know, you don't want to go around changing everybody's uh, music, like, you know, like the, the greats from, you know, 3, 000, you know, 300 years ago. Like, we're talking like Bach and all these kind of guys. You know, you're not going to take his music and change it. You know, you, you hope, if anything, you can replicate it and make you feel like you were there. That's what we're trying to experience in traditional martial arts. Like some of, you know, it's kind of cool if you see something that's been around for hundreds of years and stuff, because what it does is it kind of shows you, you know, some good ideas that you could actually still use to this day. But at the same time, um, you know, if you do study mar mo modern martial arts like I do, then it also provides confirmation. So people like to laugh at Kung Fu and all that stuff because there's a lot of people out there who study it but they are not really that good at fighting. Those are like the um, the historians of martial arts. Maybe, you know, they're not here to be fighters, you know. But you gotta understand when it comes to self-defense and all that stuff, sometimes um, something's better than nothing. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy about what works best. A lot of times, you know, anything is better than nothing. Um, so when it comes to that, it's like invalid to, to say you shouldn't study traditional Shaolin and that's blah, blah, blah. Um, no, actually, it's um, not true. It just depends on what you want. Like if you just want to be a cage fighter, go to MMA training. Uh, but if you want to know history, you go to the Chinese Shaolin Center, a place like that, you know, learn uh, traditional martial arts. So that's where I feel like I've kind of gone backwards, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I'm going backwards in time. And so... Uh, I want to learn what's modern, so I went over here and trained and um, learning boxing. Okay, it is a bomb, and they're saying old oh, boxing teach it taught like this. This is how we do in Shaolin too. Now, when I first learned boxing um, punches, he taught me my teacher um, Roger Brockman to have it right here, you know, and guard my face here, and then have this one kind of out in front. And he always says rue bumpers. He's like, you always have to have an angle there, you know. That's how we hold our guard. So when we he taught me um, the one. The two, the three, and the four. Now, it probably took many years to get these correctly, and I probably still have a long ways to go. Now, like, I've been to SVG, I've learned a couple of other things, like, so bringing it forward more, using more of a forward stance, because if you're in MMA, it, you, you may be dealing with someone who's going to, um, you know, do a wrestling move, so we come here to the front. So it's like you're fighting from a front stance, so... So for the martial art uh, systems that teach you a fighting stance, that's a front stance. That's a good idea to be able to take somebody on. Some, some arts uh, fight sideways because their rule set protects the back. So it, it, it may teach you unrealistic uh, habits. Like um, so Taekwondo, for example, we're talking about how you can fight sideways a little bit and make yourself a thinner target. But really, if you're throwing roundhouses and hook kicks, it doesn't matter how you're faced, right? So... So um, I think for self-defense, you want to be faced forward. So 
more practical format is to be facing forward. So I practice more forward facing boxing. So this is if you're in close, you should be like this. And the further away you get, the more you can goof off and go sideways and let your guard down and stuff like that, you know? Right? So um, <laughs> that's where I'm kind of revising my actual personal training is from seeing stuff like that. So the um, thing I was going to say about Taekwondo is this funny thing is, is I, I do dream once in a while that I'm in Taekwondo class someplace. And uh, before this Taekwondo school opened up here in Kalispell, um, I think I'd had a dream a pretty vivid dream about, you know, being at a Taekwondo class and getting my gi and, and, and waving bye to the instructor and then going down to train with my old Shaolin school with Master Dave and Sharon. It's so funny, you know, because, I mean, it seems to be um, a possibility that if I end up going back to Denver, I'd probably enroll and go train there as well and help get this to go away, you know, because um, it's real good cardio. If anything, you just get a lot of good exercise and a lot of good therapy, you know, might help, you know, like if you get to spar, it really helps you know, keep you from, you know, killing the people you live with and work with and stuff like that, you know, and, <laughs> right? So anyways, um, I wanted to kind of talk about this Taekwondo school because, like, uh, God, it's been 30 years since I trained with this system, and now they're trying to, like, you know, I think they've been listening to the stuff people say about Taekwondo, like, it's, you know, it, it's pretty commercial and watered down. Like, I think, like, if, um, if you saw what Taekwondo was meant to be, it would probably hurt you, you know? It's just meant to, like... Make it so like you hit hard every time, like so. So you should, uh, you should, you should be able to finish your opponent quickly. That's the idea. You should come in and just do things that just break them down and knock them out. And so it's kind of where, um, it's the opposite extreme of, uh, let's say, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like so, it doesn't really offer much in the way of de-escalation. Like really, you know, like what you want to do is knock them out and finish them because that way you're moving on to the next person, right? So, if you're somebody fighting in field battle, so like uh, Kung Fu was geared towards field battle. To some extent, Taekwondo probably was as well, you know, if they're teaching you to fight in battle, then it needs to be quick and fast. So, like, uh, that may not be the best thing for, say, civilian training. So that's where something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is really nice. If you want to be easy, let's say the opponent is somebody you can do your Jiu-Jitsu on, right? And it, it's going to, uh, you know, it's going to solve the problem. That way you don't have to knock them out or kick and break and smash and crush and all these type of things. So... Uh, so that's the funny thing. So I went from one extreme to the other by doing the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I really appreciate it for what it is. But I really think what you really need is a mixture. Like everything from this spectrum to that and everything in between. And that's where um, I kind of realized, oh, man, if, um, you know, like they say you're a Shaolin person. You're doing that kind of Kung Fu and all that and all that neat looking stuff. And that's same true with the, like uh, maybe a lot of higher karate and stuff, too. Is if you could see, you know, the wrestling aspect of your training more, you know, that's really fun fundamental to everything we do. Everything, you know, goes back to wrestling, and just hitting each other with sticks. I don't know. And if we leave that out, then you don't see the bigger picture, you know. So, so, so we're saying, you know, if you're doing kung fu and taekwondo, it should be able to defeat a wrestler. So um, that's where I feel like, okay, we do need to see some basic wrestling training more if you want to be a well-rounded martial artist. So that's we're going to the um, SBG. When you do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, some of it is wrestling, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's part of wrestling and Judo and uh, so it's like, it's part of wrestling, you know, and then like wrestling itself, you know, when it comes to these arts, it's like really a rule set, you know, that makes wrestling different from Judo and Judo different from Jiu-Jitsu, you know, but what they provide are different areas of training and they ultimately mesh and that's why a lot of these MMA people that do Jiu-Jitsu may be in either Judo or wrestling or, you know, stuff like that, so, um, that's what's helping them win, and that's why people who don't have that can't, you know, you can't go up against those other people. You have to see what they're training. So um, Taekwondo would be more effective, or Kung Fu would be more effective if you could see um, your wrestling counterpart to uh, of the training. It's actually all there. It's just the part that people don't want to train on because it deals with falling a lot, right? So, yeah. So anyways, um, this uh, Taekwondo master has a lot of mysterious ideas. Um, so I was going to say, I think my, my, my uh, perspective on how they teach the blocking is kind of like, so the, the way we chambering is really only to chamber where like if it was um, like a kung, part of a, a Kung Fu movement, you might, this might actually be the hand that it touches what I'm going to hit really hard with that block. So that is a striking block. It should practically hurt your opponent as you block them. So, so. The reason for that is that's going to possibly touch, and then, um, and the reason for that is like I'm kind of pointing to where I'm blocking, um, the reason for that, 
similarly. Or in Taekwondo, we just really want to chamber our hands like this for that block. So there's like, um, again, where I have to be able to, if I'm going to say skip from my Taekwondo class, let's say I move to Denver and I start to go to Kung Fu, then I'm going to have to change, you know, how I set step through my basics. Oh, here's an important one. I really didn't want to leave this one out, and I'm kind of glad I saved it for last. But how we strike. In Taekwondo, it's like your hands flip. Bam! At one time. So the idea is really interesting, actually. The idea of just one explosive movement, okay? Now, um, the one thing I can say I can relate to is our shingy uh, element of wood, where um, we, we come in a forward-facing stance. I think there's a shuffle step to it, but we keep our, like this. We don't turn or any of that. We keep it straight on, right, for that element of wood. Okay, so um, in Taekwondo, similarly, we stay in a front stance, for example, and throw those punches just like that. <laughs> Right? And then uh, what I was going to say is in traditional Kung Fu as well as Karate, um, when they punch, they pull the hands, like, they, they kind of cross-facing in. So it's almost like two movements. It's like, shoo-shoom, shoo-shoom, right? So um, maybe the um, thought is that makes it a more streamlined movement. But the old way, again, is um, a good idea if maybe um, you were connecting with a limb and you were guiding it off. So maybe that's why they do that. And then I'm kind of looking at how we fight when we're boxing, right? We pull it back in like this. So maybe that's the similarity. I don't know. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like we're just stretching the arm out after we meet this guarding point. I don't know. Maybe from here I realize it's safe to pull back. And that pullback hand, who knows, like, if we're just punching like this, this pullback hand might make it more powerful, you know? So, like, ideally, you know, if you're fighting, you don't want to pull your hand back. But if you have time now, I was watching somebody that uh, teaches boxing explain something like stepping back and throwing a jab to get the person to maybe throw their hands up. And what he did, he figured if they're throwing their hands up and they're busy, then it's a safe bet. You can pull back all the way, just like a karate punch, and go ahead and nail them a good one, right? That way, um, you know, you're gonna take your stance and you're gonna turn it all the way like this. So um, I'm gonna be on the ball of my back foot and then turn my hip all the way around as I punch. That's the most possible power you could possibly right, get. Uh, <laughs> so in, uh, I mean, if we're here and you need to be fast, you don't have time for that. Da, da, da. But it's when you um, make somebody guard their head that that karate punch might be valid, you know? So anyways, um. Yeah, funny thing about Taekwondo um, is it should be an evolution of martial. Ideally, that's what it's for, is to help you to find a shortcut to power, maybe just one explosive movement rather than... Now, the funny thing, when you're black belt, they want us to pull a hand all the way back. All the way back. To me, I feel like it, it's better to do the Kung Fu one if you're going to do that. Maybe you should be here by the, other, by the time the other one starts to come out. I don't know. So that's where it gets super nerdy is exactly how you should be punching and blocking. Well, anyways, I'll end it here and we'll talk later. Bye now.